Thank you everyone for our sticking with us um, through these tech issues. We think we've had them worked out. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna stay on hopping um, as long as we can, because we wanna make sure that we maximize the time with the Congresswoman. And if we have any problems, then our tech team has a backup plan for us. Uh, so with that, again, welcome Congresswoman Presley and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Uh, we understand that we don't have a lot of time, and so we want to. It's going to be somewhat of a shorter conversation and one that might be a little bit of um, rapid fire, rapid response. <laughs> okay. I have a lot of questions for you, okay. um, but I thought I would get started actually with. Um, I'm going to skip my whole introduction and all my context stuff and just get to yeah. Come on, we're family. Let's get right it. through. We just going to have a conversation, and this isn't a one off. I'll be back, y'all. <laughs> So thank you everybody for your patience. So I want to get started actually on something that you've been in the news about recently. You've been in the news previously about this, but definitely recently. Um, and that is around racial inequities and disparities in school discipline. A few weeks ago, you, I think it's the end of September, you and the Massachusetts correct congressional delegation sent a letter to Secretary DeVos and I believe Governor Baker, you know, the governor of Massachusetts, um, asking for certain things and demanding certain action. So I thought, would you please just share what was in that letter, what you're expecting, what we should be looking for? Okay, I wanna make sure I understand your question. So, um, because I, I'm in communication uh, with, with the governor often about inequities and disparities, particularly because my district um, has been the hardest hit uh, where these inequities have been laid to bear in the midst of COVID. Um, but um, was it specific to my push out legislation? Yeah, your push out okay. legislation. And also um, my understanding that there was some, you were know, going back to some of the things that were rolled back from the Obama, Obama administrations around the data, the federal level, um, when it comes to um, discipline, the data we have around some of the disparities. I'll stop sure, well, let me just speak a little bit about the legislation and again, just the, the state partnership that I was enlisting on that. Um, so uh, I introduced this legislation, the, the Ending Push Out Act. It's a continuation of work that I started uh, when I was on the Boston City Council to address the criminalization of black girls in our schools. Um, and the Department of Education, there are nine categories, as you well know, of discipline. Um, and black girls dominate six of those. And if you layer that with those that um, our students uh, living with disabilities, um, the numbers go even higher. And so, you know, the push out crisis, you know, uh, my thought partner in this work, Dr. Monique Morris of the National Black Women's Justice Institute has encouraged us to sort of change our, our verbiage and how we speak about this. It is not a pipeline. It's not a school to confinement uh, to prison pipeline because it's not a straight line. It's not linear. This is about a confluence of of, of broken and failed systems and policies. And so it's really the school to confinement pathway. And so the push out crisis is a systemic criminalization of our girls, specifically our black, black and brown girls, beginning as early as preschool. Black girls account for 54% of all girls suspended, despite being only 20% of the girls enrolled. So from kindergarten to 12th grade, black girls are seven times more likely to be suspended from school as white girls and four times more likely to be arrested. Uh, and so uh, our legislation calls for everything from the investment in those things that have been proven to work, but we just have not made the, uh, due to a deficit of political will and courage, made those investments in those social emotional wellness supports. You know, how is it that we can grow our school police uh, and invest a billion dollars over the last decade and we have school police or school resource officers to the tune of 46,000 strong when every child does not have equitable access to a school nurse, a social worker, or a, gui or a guidance counselor. And so um, the, my, my legislation uh, calls for, you know, no funds being invested in school police, making those investment in restorative justice and social emotional wellness supports, um, and then also the data collection and the reporting. I do believe that that which gets measured gets done. And so, you know, we, we need the data to continue to shine a spotlight on the criminalization of black girls in our schools. And to be clear, this is not because black girls act differently. It's not because, you know, um, um, that they, they behave any differently than any other adolescent. But the response to the same behavior is much more punitive 
for black and brown girls than it is for white girls. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to um, criminalization, when it comes to the school of confinement pathway or mass incarceration, you know, period in, in our society, I think we treat trauma with trauma. That's why we need our schools to have, to be trauma informed learning communities where everyone is well versed in the ACEs, where the question of a child that is behaving differently is not what is wrong with you, instead is, is what happened to you. So we're talking about a complete paradigm shift and I get it that with two pieces of legislation, the Ending Push Out Act, this bill is about you know working in partnership with community to develop holistic solutions that center the lived experiences of girls of color that have been impacted by cruel and discriminatory school policies and practices. Girls that are losing classroom time simply for how they show up in the world, mm -hmm. how they're shaped, how a uniform looks on them, how their mm -hmm. hair grows out of their head, mm -hmm. right? So the Ending Push Out Act, and then my other bill is the um, counseling over, cr counseling not criminalization in our school. So I think in the midst of this reckoning on racial injustice, and all the discussions around police reform and accountability that we cannot forget our learning communities. Mm -hmm. We can't forget our children, our students. So we've been, you know, I've been talking about this at that trust and with a lot of our partners that are here um, joining us, you know, for this conference. And I just want to see if we make this, take this home a little bit and how okay. it's been going on. Um, and so I'm just curious, like this this issue, you've been a champion with with um, with Dr. Morris for a while on this, making sure that this stays in your face, make sure that we're fighting for this. Why is it so close to you? Is, is it has something to do with maybe, I don't know if it's your educational experience, but why did this speak to you? Why did you say, I want to be out in the front line on this and make sure folks are paying attention? Okay, so when I ran for the Boston City Council, I ran on a platform to save our girls, girls that didn't even know they needed saving. And many people told me to go run a nonprofit. They said that was not the work of government. But I knew that it was the work of government because this criminalization is systemic. And federal policy has created and or exacerbated many of our systemic challenges. Um, and so for me, as someone who volunteered my time on any girl serving, um, board or organization committed to the safety development and wellness and health of girls, I was giving them all my cell phone number, Lynn. And mm -hmm. these girls would call me at all hours of the night. And I was opening my home, my heart, you know, um, to them. But I realized that I could not meet the scale of the, of the hurt. They were calling me and saying, you know, um, I feel unsafe in my home. Uh, I just came out. I've been kicked out. I don't have access to feminine hygiene products. I think I'm pregnant. Can I take a test at your home? I mean, it just ran the gamut. And then when I was elected to the Boston City Council as the first woman of color, first black woman to serve in that body, the first budget cycle, I asked every uh, city department and agency, what about the girls? And their answers were barely monosyllabic. By the second um, budget cycle, they came back with cross tab colored binders because they knew someone would call the question. And that is really the power of representation. You know, that someone is going to shake the table and shift the atmosphere by asking different questions. So I asked different questions based on the proximity of my lived experience and my own destabilizing factors in my household, having an incarcerated parent, being a survivor of sexual abuse, um, you know, uh, intergenerational trauma in my household. So I know from my own experience that when I was crossing the threshold into school, I was carrying many things in my emotional backpack. And I was what you would call a frequent flyer. So here I am, a child who tested gifted, but that was not showing up in my grade. And I was living in the school nurse's office. And it was not because there was anything physically wrong with me. It was simply because that was a place that felt safe for me. So I know from lived experience that trauma is a barrier to learning, is a barrier to our children making their greatest contribution. And so I'm trying to get at this in three ways. The Ending Push Out Act, which again is about the criminalization of black and brown girls disproportionately based on policies that on their face appear to be race neutral, but disproportionately impact criminalize black and brown girls. The second is the counseling, um, not criminalization in our schools bill which is about not investing in school police using federal funds for school police, but instead to invest in restorative justice and social emotional wellness supports. And then finally, I just introduced a very comprehensive bill called Strong Support for Children Act, which is about uh, uh, childhood trauma. And I actually convened the first hearing in the history of Congress on my committee on childhood trauma. 
So I think sunlight is the best disinfectant. So what I want to do always is lean in on those things that are the most uncomfortable um, and stay acutely in proximity to the hurt so that I'm never complacent in this work and then offer federal solutions because these are systemic challenges and they demand systemic solutions. And let me just say this, Lynn, precise solutions because the hurt and harm was very precise and how it has been codified through policies and lawmaking. And so the path forward must be equally as precise. Thank you for that. I mean, you're, you're, the chat is just going about shaking the table. I mean, watching it. <laughs> just go. That's, that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, um, and, and doing that by asking the questions and the questions that need to be asked. Um, and that question, hearing you say shake the table, we often talk about needing to break the table, make the table, wider, more seats at the table, or maybe- no, We need a whole new table. Yeah, a whole new table. I'm telling you, I got a picture of Shirley Chisholm behind here. Y'all can't see. I don't want to mess with me. Can y'all see it? Y'all see? There we go. Okay. I see her. Yes. So there those of you that don't know, I mean, she's a hero to many of us, but my office, 11, 11 worth, Long worth 1108 used to be her physical office, right? So she's, she's a, it's a very serendipitous. And I used to always quote her saying, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring your own folding chair. I stopped using it because I don't want us to bring a new chair to an old table. So go on. You want a new table. <laughs> exactly. I hear you. you want a whole new table. And I, I'm going to tweak a question that caused, that um, really caused a lot of buzz yesterday in our chat. And that was one of our attendees asked, how do we go from preaching to the choir to reaching those who are singing out of key? So um, I want to either put that question to you. Let me just say, now that's somebody that's heard me speak before because I always say that I'm preaching to the choir, but I preach to the choir so you will sing. So if they're asking that question, they've heard me say that. Um, but, um, you know, I think ultimately I really believe in movement building and I believe in the role that storytelling plays in movement building. And every time that I have seen the needle move on a policy, it's because we've changed hearts and minds. And we do that with the amplification of centering lived experiences in telling those stories. And so I think that's the most impactful way. Um, and that's what we have to continue to do. And how do you keep going at the same time? Because, I mean, it, we often hear that policy, the change, you keep going, but it can feel incremental. It can feel slow sometimes. What keeps you going? What keeps you your drive? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, listen, y'all, I don't think any of us have the luxury of being apathetic or cynical. You know, we're standing in the gap. And so as tempting as it is, especially given the conflation of three crises, as tempting as it is to be in a fetal position, we don't have the luxury of being apathetic, apathetic or cynical. I don't have the luxury of standing still. You know, we have got to keep moving. So I think on the most basic level, it's about me honoring my, my mother. May she rest in peace and power. It's about honoring the ancestors. It's about delivering on the mandate that the people gave me uh, when they humbled me and honored me by electing me in 2018. So it's about making good on those things. So I don't think I have the luxury. I would also add, since we talk so much, particularly in doing the work uh, for uh, the marginalized and those that are ignored, left out and left behind, we get so much instruction about the, the armor that we need to put on to navigate the world, to negotiate hostile spaces, to uh, become adept at managing microaggressions, microaggressions. But I think the thing that we don't talk enough about, that our parents didn't talk to us enough about, is that joy is a necessary act of resistance. And so, you know, I worry when it seems that so often our bonds of community are being forged um, in, in uh, staving off another attack. We have to be unapologetic in our radical joy and our healing in the same way that we are unapologetically holding space for righteous rage, for the inequities that we see that persist across every system and most of all in, in our education system. So we hold space for that righteous rage hold space for our radical and bold solutions. When I say radical, I mean the, the definition that Angela Davis uh, reminded us of. Radical is to get to the root of something. Again, these inequities, they're not naturally occurring. You know, they've been created by policy and codified over and over again. So we have to hold space, Lynn, for our righteous rage, for these inequities that persist in our education system, and then hold space for our radical and bold solutions to, to root out those inequities and disparities, and then finally hold comfortable space 
for our radical joy and healing. So that's what keeps me going, being intentional about informing that joy and being unapologetic. You know, I remember um, at a very challenging time for the country, I don't even know what was going on because we've just been emotionally rubbernecking, drinking from a fire hose of insult and assault for the last four years. But um, my husband had taken me away for a couple of hours to go apple picking. I had never done it in my life. You know, not like it's some big deprivation, but I wanted to do it, but I never did it because I was always working on a campaign, always in cycle, always, you know, serving community. And so we went apple picking and I said, I can't share this photo because look at what the world is dealing with right now. And I, but I was, but my, my family encouraged me to resist that and just said, you know, so you have to be an apologist for your humanity. That's the thing you fight for, for people every day. So, you know, so I think that's what's keeping me going is holding, is being intentional about informing joy. Look, this administration led by Betsy DeVos, okay? They are coming for everything. They are rolling back every gain we've made for survivors in the space of civil rights to, to, uh, to root out um, uh, racial inequities and disparities, to address these um, punitive discipline practices. We can't give them our joy too, Lynn. We can't give them that too. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, again, I'm still I'm still watching the chat. It's just going. Okay. Um, well, I'm not seeing the chat. It's not happening for me or time, so I'm not seeing that. But, <laughs> yeah, so I, I've got to trust your eyes, Lynn. Right. So I'm looking at one of the the questions that we we've gotten. It's about young people and making sure that we give, I guess, that radical joy, or maybe we model it for young people. Mm -hmm. So you talk to us about um, how do we or what should we be doing to activate them? Or have you seen it? And um, what does that look like? And let's just talk to our young people out there, the folks who we're fighting for. Okay. So I'm going to say something that y'all might really think is very radical. And that is that I am such a believer in youth voice uh, and the power of young people that I actually introduced a federal amendment to lower the voting age to 16. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I introduced that amendment, and by the way, for those of you who think that is crazy, uh, one of the things I'm proudest of is Congressman John Lewis was an original co-sponsor of that amendment. And 126 people supported that. But the reason I did that is because our young people, Lynn, again, they're saddled with adult burdens and responsibilities already. These young people grew up like how I grew up, how many of us grew up. I was not working a part-time job for enrichment. I wasn't working a part-time job to build my resume. I was working a part-time job because I had to contribute since I was 14 to my family's household. These young people are raising younger siblings. Um, they are working multiple jobs. Um, they are dealing with the trauma of growing poverty, of gentrification, displacement, homelessness, fear of deportation, COVID. And at the same time, they are leading us. They continue to be on the front lines and at the fore of every great social movement as history has shown us. And right now, with an existential threat to our humanity, our democracy, to our country, from gun violence prevention, to climate justice, to racial justice, to um, confronting this administration, they continue to lead. So I don't, all I, my words for them are, continue to do that. And my words to our peers, our adults, is that we never say that we're here to be a voice for the voiceless, that we never say that we are here to be a voice for young people because no one is truly voiceless, Lynn. What they are is unheard. And it's incumbent upon us to continue to create space for their voices to be heard, for their lived experiences to be seen uh, for what they are, which is, which it qualifies them as experts. How is it that we can have school committees with a young person uh, appointed to that committee that does not even have voting power. I don't think that's appropriate. So we do a lot of talking about and talking to young people. We've got to partner with them in meaningful, uh, real ways. And we have to um, celebrate and encourage their leadership. And to me, that means not just seeking their input, but actively engaging them in the implementation. And so that's why, you know, one of the reasons why I support lowering the voting age to 16, because we are shaping a world that they will inherit Lynn. And these young people deserve to elect people that are going to do something about student debt. I want to do something about that for y'all. I can't believe there are teachers who have lost licensure because they have defaulted on their loans, debt that they incurred 
because they wanted to be nation builders. That's where y'all are. Y'all pour into people who go on to pour into community and to build up our nation. And this is a $1.6 trillion student debt crisis. We have 855,000 federal borrowers in Massachusetts. This is a real issue. So young people deserve to have a say in who is elected, who is shaping the world that they will inherit. Thank you. Thank you. Clapping, clapping, clapping. They're going for it. Um, so I, I, the, I'm going to end it with this, um, this last question. And the title of this, this session was What's Next? Mm -hmm. And so I have a lot of folks out there in the audience are asking, what's next for what what's next for them? What do you think that we need to be doing besides along with voting? Mm -hmm. What do we need to do now? What should be next for us now as equity warriors that we are in this in this in this? Yes. Equity warriors. Um Okay, so I believe you have, and Sarah will clear it up in the chat if I'm wrong, until 6 a.m. tomorrow, if you have not already done it, to complete your census. I represent the Massachusetts 7th Congressional District, which is Boston, Cambridge, Somerville, Randolph, Everett, Chelsea, and Milton. This is a district almost 800,000 people strong. This is a district that is 53% people of color, 40% foreign born, and a district that has been hardest hit by this pandemic. Um, and this is also one of the most under-resourced districts in the country. And that is because we are one of the most undercounted. So for every person that is not counted, and this really hurts our children, we're missing out on $2,300 of federal investment. So I need you all to complete the census so that our communities, instead of being over-policed and under-resourced, can get the federal investment that they deserve because the census determines everything from your access to fresh and healthy food, to uh, access to affordable housing, to language access, social security, Medicare, and public education. So if you are serious about racial injustice and disparities and particularly how they show up when it comes to education, complete your census. And I believe you have until 6 a.m. tomorrow to do that. And Sarah Grohl, my indomitable chief of staff, will hopefully put in the chat where folks can go to to do that. And then voting. Um, and then I would just say, as the old adage goes, bloom where you were planted, Lynn. I know that these things can be very overwhelming, the, the gravity of the challenges that we're dealing with, you know, structural systemic racism, a pandemic, economic hardship, everything is unprecedented. But bloom where you are planted. I'm very encouraged by the collective care and the mutual aid that we've seen as a result of this pandemic. You know, neighbors who have suddenly created a garden so that they can feed you know, uh, their block. These are the sorts of things like, I want us to weather this storm and come out on the other side, but there are some things that we have um, innovated as a community to weather these unprecedented storms that I hope that we keep beyond the pandemic. So complete your census, vote, make sure you have a plan to vote, make sure the people you care about have a plan to vote, and then bloom where you are planted. You know, don't feel the pressure of I have to do everything. Just do what you can where you are with what you have. But Lynn, honestly, I don't know what else y'all want to do. You're educators. You already do it all. I'm fighting for you so y'all can stop being caseworkers, social workers, nurses. I'm trying to fight for you all to get the federal investment so I am just as committed to you thriving as I am our, our children, you know, our students and our young people. So y'all are already doing it. So I'm just going to say I appreciate you immensely. And please don't ever hesitate to let us know how we can better support you in your work. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Complete the census, vote, and bloom where you are. Bloom where you are. Planted. Planted. Do <laughs> what you can where you are. That's really all that means. There we go. So thank you. Um, I'm going to pass it over to um, Marielle. And I'm so glad we were able to do this and have this conversation. Thank you, so, Lynn. Thanks thank for rolling thank with the punches. I'll be back, y'all. I'm sorry. Yeah. That the tech was not on our side today, but we thank you all for hanging in there, Marielle. Thank you very much. for Come your back and Thank you for your incredible introduction. You know, I was trying to talk to you, but all the little mean tech goblins My were getting in the way. <laughs> so thank you for that. All right. Murray, great. Oh, thank you, thank you.
I am going to um, transition us. I am trying not to cry, actually. <laughs> you can't tell. Um, you see, you can see now why the first time I met the Congresswoman, I was just speechless. Um, in the same way that right now, there's not much more to be said um, because she has said it all. But what I can say from my perspective as somebody in your district, Congresswoman, is that you have been a light for us, um, not just throughout this pandemic, but especially during this pandemic when, as you very well named, um, our district has been incredibly hard hit by the confluence of pandemic. And yet we know and we knew that we had you. And we know and we knew that you have our backs. And so from the bottom of my heart, thank you for fighting for us. We are fighting with you by your side, doing the damn thing um, and, and, and please come back. Thank you for bearing with the, the tech issues, everybody. Um, wow, I'm clearly overwhelmed. Um, we are going to transition now um, to state time. Um, hopefully you get an opportunity in your state spaces to just kind of ugh, <laughs> share what is moving in your spirit, in your minds, in your hearts. That was a packed 30 minutes. And so we sincerely hope that you use this time um, to, to just check in with each other about what that was like for you. Um, we are going to come back to this main stage in just um, 30 minutes, I believe. Can somebody fact check me? Um, at 4 p.m. Eastern time to hear from our Ed Trust president and CEO, Dr. John B. King Jr. Um, and so we will see you back here super soon. We are incredibly excited. Um, if you, again, do not have a state um, that you see listed, feel free to take this time as free time uh, and we'll see you all soon.